Um, this was ages ago, but um, I had just started doing research in distributive justice and how people allocate scarce resources. And so um, a friend of mine thought I really should meet with Tom, um, who was um, interested in procedural justice, a newly really hot topic in social psychology at that time. Where can we hear that coming from? Um, and something that um, Tom was really well known for is some of his research that, that supported the idea of something called the fair process effect. And this is the idea that people are more likely to accept negative or unfavorable um, material outcomes when they are the result of fair rather than not fair procedures. Yeah. And the thought is by being treated with dignity and respect and having voice in decision um, outcomes, people feel um, a greater sense of belonging. Um, that, and that having these belongingness needs was thought to be way more important than actually achieving preferred outcomes, like in the favorable or unfavorable decision out of a result of a process. Um, but I brought up the time, you know, but what about cases like Roe v. Wade? Um, the United States, we in the United States have been fighting about Roe v. Wade for, you know, close to 50 years now. And um, people, I, I said, I don't think there's a procedure fair enough um that would lead people to accept or everyone to accept the outcome in Roe v. Wade about um, making abortion legal in the United States. It'd become one of those major wedge issues um, that we were just discussing just as we were starting this talk. And Tom responded um, that he, he he thought that if people thought the procedures of the Supreme Court were fair, they would also accept the outcome of Roe v. Wade. Um, and that they must not therefore have thought the procedures of the Supreme Court was fair, um, which was kind of odd given that the US Supreme Court, at least at that time and um, for, until quite recently was considered the most um, legitimate and procedurally fair institution in the United States. So I was just like, really? Um, the people would accept even um, an outcome of like um, legalizing abortion is fair if the procedure was su sufficiently fair? It just didn't seem to pass a smell test for me. And I really actually mulled on this for quite a while before I started doing research on it. But um, eventually, came up, we came up with a hypothesis that when people have a moral mandate, or that is a moral commitment to an issue, um, and in this case, in particular, a decision outcome like that abortion should be legal or abortion should not be legal, um, we hypothesize that they will care more about achieving their morally preferred end than they would care about how is, it is achieved. And this was really going against about 25 years of research that really had um, demonstrated that procedural fairness really was, um, or certainly appeared to be from all those studies, to be the dominant thing that people really paid attention to um, and, and when thinking about whether their outcomes were fair or unfair. Um, but none of those studies actually studied whether people had a moral commitment to those outcomes. Um, instead, they were um, studying whether people, you know, got their preferred or non-preferred outcomes. Like, sure, we would all prefer to get a raise, um, but sometimes based on the um, evaluation procedures and so forth, we might not. And we might accept that if we think the procedures are fair. But what about cases like the Elian Gonzalez case, where people really do have a strong moral investment in the outcome? And you may not remember or even been born <laughs> when Elian Gonzalez's case was happening. Um, but this was a case where Elian um, was traveling with his mother in a rubber boat from Cuba trying to illegally immigrate into the United States. And they got within about a mile of the shore of Florida um, when their small boat capsized. Unfortunately, there were a couple of fishermen in the area, and they were able to save two people from um, this boat of 30 people that had capsized. So many, many souls were lost. Um, but this five-year-old little boy, Elian, was one of them. Um, Elian was placed in, a, placed in a temporary custody of his relatives in Miami, Florida. Um, and it turned into not only um, an issue that was really salient in the United States, but also became a worldwide concern because about this cute little kid and his fate. Um, basically, the argument was, uh, should he be allowed to stay in the United States with his relatives there, um, given how the sacrifices his mother made trying to um, attempt to bring him to a place where he could be raised in um, political freedom, 
Or um, should he be returned to his father who was still in Cuba? And people have very strong moral investments on, on both sides of that particular issue. And we therefore thought that this might be a particularly good good example for putting the fair process effect on the one hand and the moral mandate hypothesis on the other into in, in for its test. And so what we did was we collected a nationally representative web-based sample in the United States. Um, and participants for this study were um, contacted on three, three occasions. Um, they were contacted on April 6th, with a, which was about two weeks before a raid where U.S. Marshals um, you'll notice the picture here um, with Elian. They actually grabbed Elian at gunpoint um, and seized him from his Miami relatives and took him into um, federal custody. Um, we had managed, we luckily got data collected before that happened. Um, we, um, we then collected um, data again four days after the raid from the same people in order to get their judgments of um, the fairness of the federal government going in and seizing him. And then we also um, ran another survey on June 28th when the final decision was made that Elian should be returned to Cuba. Um, and what we had in terms of measurement is we had people's um, not only the preferred outcomes, but the degree to which they were morally invested in the outcome that Elian should stay in the United States versus be returned to Cuba. Now, there was quite a bit of variability, not only in terms of what people's outcome preferences were, but the degree to which they actually saw these um, outcome preferences in moral terms. And what we did is we um, took people's pre-raid perceptions of having a moral mandate in the case um, and used it to try to predict post-resolution um, decision acceptance, but we also had it to predict post-resolution procedural fairness and outcome fairness as well. And in every model that we fit, um, pre-raid judgments of procedural fairness, how fair they thought um, the U.S. government was and legitimate and so forth in terms of handling the case. And our, our judgments of procedural fairness were very specific to how they were handling the case before the raid, um, did not improve model fit. Okay, so their baseline perceptions of the procedural fairness of how the U.S. government was handling the case just didn't matter. What mattered um, was whether they had a moral investment in the case, and that predicted directly whether they thought um, the decision was acceptable. If you were morally invested that he should stay in the United States, you thought the decision was unacceptable, and if you were morally committed that he should be returned to Cuba, you thought it was uh, unacceptable. But it also had a mediate effect through post-raid perceptions of procedural fairness. Um, now, we use exactly the same rate um, if, uh, measures of procedural fairness from time one to time two, but again, interestingly enough, that time one measure didn't predict time two. What predicted time two perceptions of procedural fairness was whether you agreed or disagreed with the idea that only it should be returned to Cuba. If you thought he should be returned to Cuba, you thought that um, taking custody of Elian by, by force was fine, and if you thought he should stay in the United States, you thought it was heinous. Um, but basically, we interpreted these results to be more consistent with um, the moral mandate hypothesis that when people have a moral investment in outcomes, they don't get you know, their standing perceptions of the fairness of the procedures being used to decide the case just don't matter. Okay, what matters is whether the procedures yield um, people's preferred outcome. Um, we tested this hypothesis again in a, in a case, frankly, that was more closely re resembled Roe v. Wade, which was um, that is actually testing hypotheses in the context of a real Supreme Court decision. Um, this was again using a nationally representative sample of um, just over a thousand participants. Um, what we did is we took measures um, before the Supreme Court heard arguments in a case that was a challenge to Oregon's um, physician assisted suicide law. They called it the Death with Dignity Act. It was the first state to legalize um, physician assisted. Um, suicide in the United States. Um, so before the Supreme Court even heard arguments in the case, we took people's standing judgments of the perceived legitimacy, um, their trust in and the procedural fairness of the Supreme Court. Um, we measured the support or opposition of physician-assisted suicide, the degree to which their attitudes on these issues were moral convictions, and also the degree to which um, their attitude on physician-assisted suicide was a religious conviction, which was more or less a control. We waited around then for the Supreme Court to actually make a ruling in this case, um, which was 
um, to uphold Oregon or the Oregon State's legislature's um, dignity with, um, I can't remember now what it is, dignity with death act. Um, and we then went in and took post decision measures of how fair um, people thought that outcome was, the degree to which they accepted that outcome is um, final and binding. And then the same measures of legitimacy, trust, and procedural fairness in the Supreme Court that we had taken pre-measures. Um, and just to orient you towards this graph, um, the graph on the um, y-axis is unique variance explained, okay? Um, and what you can see here is that um, outcome fairness judgments um, were uniquely explained by both um, religious convictions the more um, the religiously convicted were almost uniformly opposed to the idea of physician assisted suicide, and so they thought that the decision was um, pretty much uniformly unfair. But then people's moral convictions about the decision also explained unique variance in people's outcome um, judgments of outcome fairness. Um, this is actually the effect size associated with an interaction term. Um, that if you were morally convicted that people should be allowed to choose when to end their lives. Um, you thought that the outcome of the Supreme Court decision was um, perfectly fair. If you did not think the Supreme Court should be, um, I'm sorry, if you did not think position assisted suicide should be allowed, you thought the Supreme Court decision was unfair. And the same pattern of results um, emerged with um, whether you thought, whether you accepted the decision of the court to be binding or not. What's rather remarkable is the red bars. And that was um, people's pre-rulings judgments of legitimacy of the court. And in this case, we're combining um, legitimacy, procedural fairness, and trust. Um, didn't explain any variance in people's outcome fairness judgments and less than 1% of the variance in people's um, decision acceptance, um, which is completely counter to what you would predict um, based on the fair process effect. But it's quite consistent with what you would predict on, um, based on the moral mandate effect. And by the way, I should point out that people's religious convictions about um, physician assisted suicide and their moral convictions about physician assisted suicide were weakly correlated, only about 0.3. So these are really very independent ideas. We also compared um, the unique effects of moral and religious conviction on. Um, That's the same slide. Um, it's, I actually um, didn't copy on the right slide, but we um, wanted to see if um, whether the Supreme Court's decision affected people's um, perceptions of the legit legitimacy of the court. And then we have a slide for this, but we, um, what it would show if I had the right slide would be that um, religious convictions actually had no consequences um, in terms of predicting changes in procedural fairness, decision acceptance, or um, legitimacy of the court. Um, the religious convicted didn't like the decision, um, but they didn't change their perceptions of the court because of it. That said, the morally convicted um, participants did change their perceptions of the court as a function of whether it ruled consistently or inconsistently with their, um, their moral convictions. Okay, that if the court, quote, got it right, um, they saw the court as subsequently more procedurally fair, legitimate, and trustworthy. Whereas if the court got it wrong, they saw the Supreme Court as less trustworthy, less legitimate, and less procedurally fair. Now I'm going to share one more study with you um, about challenges to the fair process effect. Um, and this is a vigilantism study. Now basically what this study um, did is that we pre-tested um, whether participants had strong moral convictions about the idea that guilty defendants must be convicted, and innocent defendants must be, and that should be acquitted. And in fact, we found that they uniformly did have strong moral convictions about that. Um, we then gave participants a newspaper article about a crime that involved the murder of a young married couple during the course of a burglary. Um, the police investigation and subsequent arrests were described, and the procedure was described as biased and unfair, um, with concrete example, examples about how it was biased and unfair or unbiased and fair. And then we also manipulated whether sources close to the case, um, this was described in a phone newspaper article, were either quite certain the defendant was guilty, quite certain the defendant was innocent, 
are deeply ambivalent about the defendant's guilt or innocence. And given that everybody had um, moral convictions at the onset, at the idea that the guilty must be convicted and the innocent must be acquitted, um, we assume these conditions were the morally mandated conditions, whereas the deeply ambivalent condition um, would be a non-mandated condition. And then they learn that the defendant dies either because he's convicted of murder and is given a death sentence, or he is shot and killed on his way to trial by vigilante. Um, and what this was trying to manipulate in a very strong way was whether um, the defendant died as a function of a due process and a fair process, or whether he died by a very um, illegitimate and extra legal process. Um, so uh, this graph represents um, how fair or unfair was the outcome of this incident. So that is what has happened to the defendant. And what you can see when he was guilty, um, um, they thought it was very fair that he was killed. And it didn't matter whether he was killed through um, vigilantism or trial. And when they thought he was innocent, they thought it was very unfair that he was killed. And again, it didn't matter whether he was killed through vigilantism or um, a fair trial. The only case where this really strong manipulation of procedural fairness had any effect um, was in the ambiguous defendant condition. Under those conditions, um, the fairness of the procedures, whether he died by vigilantism or a trial, um, did have a, a major effect. I think the reason why the fairness for the trial um, bar, however, is not particularly high is that people do walk into these situations um, with a presumption of defendant guilt. And we found basically the same pattern of results with, um, interestingly enough, with people's judgments of procedural fairness. Um, that they saw um, the procedures of vigilanteism in a trial is, is not significantly different when the defendant was um, thought to be guilty, not significantly different when they thought him to be innocent. Um, again, they only noticed the fairness of the procedures and the condition when the defendant's guilt was ambiguous. So I would argue that this really challenged the fair process effect. Um, and that when people do have a moral investment in decision outcomes, they care more about achieving those outcomes than how they are achieved. But it really begs the question of why, okay? Which finally brings me to the topic really of what today's talk um, title is what it is. And the, the way that we, or the hypotheses that we had about why um, you get different effects when people have moral, morally convicted outcome preferences and when they don't, um, was that different identity concerns were in play. Um, now, the group value model and most models of procedural fairness really, you know, they do argue, and I'm generally fine, that the reasons why procedures matter so much to people is that they really serve people's social identity needs. Okay, um, being treated with dignity and respect and other aspects of procedural fairness and given voice in proceedings um, communicates inclusion, um, standing, and respect. Okay, but when people have moral, moral convictions um, or morally convicted outcome preferences, it might be the case that instead of being concerned about their social identity needs, they become more concerned about their personal identity needs. And this is a need to be internally self-consistent, to live up to one's moral values, um, to, you know, it's pulling at their sense of conscience and their beliefs about moral authenticity. They may, may feel a really strong pressure um, to live up to these internalized standards of oughts and should when they've got a moral um, conviction about the outcome preference, and therefore they care less about being included and standing in respect. But what we realized is that this is how we interpreted our findings. We never explicitly tested the identity implications. Okay, lots of procedural fairness studies have tested um, whether procedural fairness is about social identity, but we had never explicitly tested whether people's um, moral convictions were really about personal identity. And in the interim, from when the studies that I just described to you were published, um, a number of studies started coming out really saying that moral convictions are about social identity. Um, Pierce Ekstrom, for example, um, came out with a dissertation um, that moral conviction really functionally serves as a social identity. 
And Martin von Zomeron ha, um, has done numerous studies in terms of um, his model of collective action that really suggests that um, maybe it starts out as personal identity, but then moral convictions quickly get translated in, in, into a politicized identity that in turn predicts becoming more politically engaged. Okay, so these number of publications were coming out really suggesting that moral convictions were much more about social than they were personal identity. Um, and to, to a considerable degree, they didn't even consider the possibility that it might be about personal identity instead of social identity. Um, and they have some good reasons for believing it. Um, why would moral conviction be an expression of social identity? Um, Naomi Elmer's uh, finds um, that expressing um, learned moral norms and beliefs of a specific group um, is associated with being perce perceived as a group, the group member. Um, Martine finds that moral convictions are related to concerns about the collective good. I mean, again, as I mentioned earlier, that um, his research correlationally finds that individual moral convictions do lead to stronger um, politicized identities that subsequently seems to predict um, acting in the collective good. Um, Lindsay um, Novak, who is here, she um, might wave to you, um, is one of my graduate students who decided to tackle this issue of identity and moral conviction um, as part of her master's thesis research. So everything I'm gonna tell you from here on out um, is all the credit is due to Lindsay. Um, and again, her goal was to more explicitly test and compare um, the relationship between social and personal identity and moral conviction. So she conducted three studies as part of her master's thesis to try to get at this. Um, the agenda of her first study was to develop um, new measures of the personal and social identity relevance of attitudes. Um, there really wasn't a measure of that. Um, and then the second goal was to test the degree to which people's moral convictions um, reflect, reflect people's sense of personal identity, social identity, or possibly both, or neither. Um, so the initial study of this was with a sample of 353 students, and um, hypotheses were tested in the context of people's moral convictions and the identity relevance of the issues of same-sex marriage, gun control, and capital punishment. Um, the measures, um, you have a typo there, but um, T-O, to what extent does your attitude about X reflect the following? And the personal identity measures um, or items were my sense of who I am as a person, my true self, my core self, um, my ideas about what kind of person I really am, my private opinions about myself, and so on. The social identity items were... Um, the degree to which people's attitudes about something reflected my desire to maintain close relationships, to avoid unnecessary conflict with others, a signal to others that I'm a group, good group member, um, the values of the group most important to me, my identification with central groups in my life, and so on. Um, some of these items were borrowed from other kinds of identity measures that have already been out there, but that had never been explicitly um, attached to um, trying to understand people's um, attitudes. And just to make it um, part of the story short, um, is that the exploratory factor analyses in study one found two factor solutions. Um, confirmatory factor analyses in studies um, two and three confirmed the um, two factor solution. And that the um, internal consistency of these measures is quite good. So we're not really going to be talking a lot more about the measurement aspect of it although we um, can certainly answer questions about that later. Um, so what we did in the study is we actually asked people about um, their moral convictions, um, their side of issue, and the degree to which their attitudes on each of these issues reflected their personal um, social identity concerns. And what you can see here is a regression model um, that indicates that um, strength of personal identity predicted people's moral convictions about all three issues, whereas um, people's, um, the social identity relevance of the attitudes did not. Um, we also did not find an interaction between people's um, personal identity and social identity. 
um, indices of their attitudes. Um, which is suggestive support for the idea that maybe personal identity may matter more in people's morally convicted attitudes than their social identity concerns. Um, study two was a conceptual replication and extension. Um, do individual differences in self-construal qualify the results of study one was an extension part? Um, then what we wondered was whether we found the pattern of results that we did because um, the United States is a highly individualistic culture. That said, there's considerable within culture variation and um, people's self-constrols um, or cultural orientations. Um, we actually had two measures of basically um, self-constrol or um, kind of cultural orientation or cultural mindset. Um, we used traditional measures of independent and interdependent um, self-concept, but we also had the moral foundations measures. Um, that is the degree to which people endorse the individualizing versus the binding foundations. Um, we also measured these at two separate time points. In time one, um, participants completed the self-control measures. And in time two, they measured, we measured the same identity and moral conviction scales used in study, study one. Now, what you can see here again is in um, step one, um, personal identity continued to um, explain um, variance in people's moral convictions about all three issues. Um, and social identity did not. Um, interactions were for the most part non-significant and where they were significant, it explained less than 1% of the variance. So we did not take any of these terribly seriously. We found that, um, basically a very similar pattern of results that we used um, the individualizing and binding moral foundations is a separate operationalization of people's cultural mindsets. Um, our goal in study three was to test the generalizability effects of these effects in cultures that varied in individualism and um, collectivism. Even if there might be individual variation and commitments to these different worldviews in the United States, um, maybe we're still missing something. Um, so it seems like a quite reasonable hypothesis that if you um, have a really collectivistic mindset, that social identity concerns might play a more important role in your moral convictions um, than they would if you had a more um, individualistic mindset. So what we did is we extended um, investigation to a cross-cultural comparison of cloud research participants in the US and in India. Um, I should note that we also had a, um, an English proficiency screener for both samples. Um, to make sure that everybody could understand our, our questionnaires and measures. We also um, ex extended the generalizability by testing three new issues. Um, these were issues that um, informants from India told us that had some purchase in India, and that was specifically issues around climate change, such as higher taxes on fossil fuels and limiting restrictions on future oil exploration. And what we found was, um, very similar effects to what we observed before. Um, the personal identity explained more um, variance than um, social identity and people's reported moral convictions. We did find um, a couple of interactions in a couple of the topic areas, um, but once again, the R squared change didn't account for even you know one percent of the variance. Well, I guess one percent in oil exploration. And really what it was is that the slopes were slightly, just slightly um, less steep in India than they were in um, the United States. So the results of studies one and two um, replicated in study three with three new issues and across two different cultural contexts. Um, and the conclusion is that, again, that moral convictions appear to have stronger ties to personal than social identity. So this is a bit of a scorecard across the studies. Um, on basically, the results that we observed for personal versus social identity. Um, again, we found significant effects um, basically across um, nine replications um, for the strength of personal identity. Um, surprisingly, no effects for social identity. Um, and we were really surprised, frankly, at um, not finding at least some moderators. <laughs> 
Um, these research findings are consistent with research that does find um, support for the moral mandate effect, um, but also other re research results from um, moral convictions line of research, um, which is that moral convictions are generally immune to authority and pure influence. Um, without going into a lot of detail about these studies, um, we've done things like a, um, a Milgram-like conformity study, I'm sorry, Nash-like conformity study and not finding similar effects. You know, that um, moral convictions seem to inoculate people from that kind of majority influence. Um, um, Hornsey has done similar studies um, where people are immune to the effects of majority influence um, or normative influence. Um, it's also consistent with the idea that moral convictions are used as internal guides for thoughts and actions, such as Austin's shoulds. And it's consistent with the idea that um, if acting against one's moral convictions um, would be akin to not recognizing oneself. Um, there's been some interesting research done by Strominger and Nichols that finds that when um, failing to be morally authentic or, co or coherent um, would mean that people, that they judge themselves, that they wouldn't even recognize themselves if they behaved in that way. So in conclusion, um, pre previous research that has hypothesized that identity concerns um, as motivating the effects of moral conviction has either made indirect inferences, me, um, about the role of identity, or not considered um, whether personal addition to um, social identity might play a role. When the roles of um, both personal and social identity are directly tested and compared, um, moral convictions have closer ties to personal than social identity concerns. And we will end there and open it for questions. <laughs>